Well, well, in fact, in fact, it is measurable, and of course, it's only a calculation in reference to calculating the size to be somewhere between five and seven times the diameter of the Earth. So they can do a measurement on that. The, the obviously the tail would approximate right at the width of that planet passing and dragging the junk around behind it um, when we pass through what is going to be an extraordinary meteor storm, a meteor shower, whatever you want to call it, when you pass through all that junk. It will take, according to the experts, I believe the estimate was, it would take an hour to pass through the tail, depending again on the angle, the angularity of its approach, and whether it comes in on our the plane of the ecliptic, which is uh, the plane of uh, where all of our planets basically are on themselves, if it's on that plane or if it's coming in 30 or 40 degrees off from a southern direction, which some people are arguing uh, would be the case, that'll change things a little bit. But basically, when we go through it, it will take about an hour to go through it. The Earth, of course, is spinning on a regular basis, um, so uh, we um, uh, will be spinning and we'll be exposing uh, uh, many countries to it every time to the front passing through, so to speak. Uh, then we will go on around. The planet will be, uh, Nibiru would be ahead of us, so to speak, going around the sun, uh, and then it will... Uh, make its inevitable turn and be dragged back and thrown out in outer space again. Uh, that would be, according to um, experts, it would be about 155 days of travel time between going out at, around the sun and then coming back out, traveling out in the outer space. So it would be about 155 days, and we will go through it, through the tail, one more time, uh, to be bombarded a second time. Uh, the effects, again, the big one is going to be air, space debris hitting us as meteorites or asteroids or whatever it would refer to at that time, space junk. That's going to be serious. But prior to that, we may already be in the dark because of failed electricity. And the rest of it, of course, is the gravitational effects. You know, we forget a little bit, uh, I think on a regular basis, the sun and the moon is what affects our, our um, uh, tides on a daily basis. And those are very small gravitational effects with the moon quite a distance out and not very big compared to uh, Nibiru. But it pulls the water in and out, causing our tides. Now, when you have something that's a solid, dense, which they're assuming that it is by calculation, this dense rock going around the size, five times the size of Earth, the gravitational effect could potentially be exactly what happened during Noah's flood, mm -hmm, and that exactly. was that the oceans were literally yanked out of the seabeds and thrown up on the shore. And uh, not counting the potential tsunamis like the one that we saw a couple of years ago when it wiped out uh, two or three parts of, the, of the, um, uh, the Far East with that one tsunami that was set up only by a medium-sized earthquake in the ocean. When we have a multitude of school bus-sized space junk hitting into the oceans all around the globe, we will have tsunamis that are going to be uh, 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 immeasurable. It doesn't make any difference. If you refer to the Bible even as a good text for history, the Revelations is amazing because, for one thing, it talks about uh, the, what, the effects of a 26-degree tilt, which is apparently what did take place many years ago on the, on the face of the earth. Uh, that's not a lot on one hand, but if it happens in a short period of time, it certainly is going to do a number. And what was amazing, I thought, for myself is in Revelation 6, uh, 15, 16, it says that the, the kings and the, of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong hid themselves away in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. And if that's not what they've ended up doing by digging these underground facilities for themselves, 
uh, I don't know what is. It's such an, an amazing description of exactly what has happened going down into uh, uh, building these 103 of these hideouts. Now, there's another problem that uh, I even hate to mention because it's something that's nothing to compare it to, but we have about 100 nuclear power generation operations in America, and one or two of those uh, going into a meltdown because it was in, in, unable to be cooled properly or something, and it becomes a Chernobyl, in, like in Russia. But if we end up having 40 of them out of 100 go south, I can't imagine the, uh, the problems that we're going to have with that. Uh, and again, that's separate from uh, uh, tsunami waves and all the rest of the... Um, possibility of solar flares and what have you. You're, if you add something as catastrophic as uh, 10, 12, or 35 nuclear power plants going south, well, we'd be really in a problem. Oh, no wonder good. they're going under the ground. Let's go to JR now, truck driving in Virginia. Welcome to the program. JR, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, George. Hi. Uh, great show. Uh, I was just curious, how do we know that all this money is going to fill these facilities just to hide from satellite observation. I, I, I say that again. I'm sorry, all the money what? Say that again. Uh, how do we know all this money that is building these facilities? Is it, the facilities aren't being built uh, just to hide from satellite observation? Uh, no. Well, first off, it's uh, the, the, the numbers uh, the numbers of facilities are extraordinary. Number two, this is being done in China and Russia and Europe, the same as we are. They are doing it for themselves. And in, in, in China, for example, they have them so large. And by the way, I have, George, we have live footage and photographs uh, of all of, not all of them, but of many of the facilities on the DVD so people get a handle of the size of these things. The ones in China are so large that they are hiding away entire battleship fleets, fleets of aircraft, and over 3,000 intercontinental ballistic missiles underground in China in advance. They're already in there, not counting the facilities that have been set up for foods, foodstuffs, and for saving uh, their own uh, lives. It is going to be one heck of a moment when it comes close. Tell me about the, the, the first line of evidence that w you got presented to you, first of all, John. Well, both these men, and, and one didn't know the other was approaching me, by the way. They both told me about the effects of, of uh, the tenth planet when it comes to our solar system, which are um, the oceans coming out of the basins, 200-mile-an-hour winds for maybe a day or two, uh, possibly a coronal mass ejection as, as part of it. That may or may not happen, uh, what uh, some people call a kill shot. And uh, earthquakes, violent uh, 8.5, 9.0 earthquakes uh, all over the planet. Um, so, <laughs> and of course volcanoes popping off. Mm. Uh, pretty wild stuff. But there's evidence, uh, James, that this has happened numerous times in the past. And before the... Uh, Evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin became so ingratiated in, in uh, scientific uh, theory mm -hmm. uh, in the 18, beginning the 1840s. Uh, most scientists believed in, in a catastrophic uh, scenario of how this planet goes through very rapid, very violent changes. Mm. Because that's, quite frankly, that's where the evidence points to. Not slow, gradual change, but rapid, uh, violent change. And uh, a, an author, a doctor named Emanuel Valakowski, he wrote, uh, three or four books back in the 1950s and 60s, sure. and he he went he personally went to parts of the planet where he can still find the evidence of violent, rapid change in the form of bones of, of various animals all jumbled together in caves where they all met their uh, their death from being smashed there by water, and, and other sources of evidence. So um, that that was my beginning point 15 years ago. Once I verified that it was real, I started my own research. And things were going along quite well, James, until the summer of, oh, it would have been summer of 2005, I guess it was. 
when I was having lunch with a friend of mine, I served with in the Army. Mm-hmm. He's a, a dual-service veteran, U.S. Army Special Forces and U.S. Navy SEAL. And he told me about a classified briefing he'd been to in 1985. Wow. And at that classified briefing, they were all told, gentlemen, during your lifetimes, these oceans are going to come out of their basins, flooding all coastal areas worldwide up to about 400 feet above what we now call sea level. And when you, when it comes time to retire, gentlemen, you just might want to retire to the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks as one of the known safe havens. Now, since that briefing, or since I had talked to my friend about that briefing, James, uh, I, I also do something else. You didn't mention in my bio. I teach concealed carry training where uh, men and women in Missouri can get their permit to carry pistols concealed. Wow. And in the process of that, I've met about two dozen more of these Navy veterans, all of whom were at the same briefing, all of whom retired in the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks because of the briefings that they received. And I've, I've been able to backtrack the very first of those briefings back in 1979 also when one of my listeners up in Montana uh, helped set up the, the chairs, the tables, the light system, the sound uh, for a briefing of admirals on a Saturday morning down in New Orleans. So it's been uh, quite a uh, experience to uh, locate these veterans who were at these briefings, debrief them myself, and of course along the way I recreated the map that the veterans were shown at these briefings, a map showing North America with new coastlines and an inland sea where the Mississippi River is now, inland sea, 100, 200 miles wide, 100, 200 feet deep, splitting the country in two north-south. Um, Velikovsky was quite a genius, and, and he's quite uh, quite the analyst himself, uh, John. Well, he was a medical doctor, and uh, his uh, profession gave him enough uh, financial wherewithal to travel to these remote parts of the of the world and make these personal observations. Now, when you start finding tiger bones mixed up with elephant bones, mm-hmm. mixed up with horses, mixed up with goats, all in the same cave, all jumbled together, mm-hmm. you know something very, very disastrous happened there. Of mm-hmm. course it did, yeah. uh, when the bones are mixed together in that manner. Yeah, um, something else Velikovsky did that no ar- archaeologist ever taken the time to do, and that was to reconcile ancient calendars from from various ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. Just like you reconcile your checkbook. Um, You can't compare events, natural events, uh, that that have happened in in the deep past, James, unless you can compare calendars. And no archaeologist had ever taken the time to do that. Well, Velikowski did. And once, once he reconciled the ancient calendars, then he was able to line up and make sense of the catastrophes that had happened three, four, and five thousand years ago, where nobody else had been able to do that, and he found out that these catastrophes all lined up together. That the the people who lived in South America two, three, four thousand years ago, the people that lived in Scandinavia three thousand years ago, uh, in Egypt and in China, all had calendars and all left written records. And once he made that determination. He was able to determine, for example, the Great Flood. Uh, every culture that had a calendar and left written records all recorded the Great Flood having, happening at the same time. In the book, in the book of Isaiah in the Bible, the Hebrew army needed a few more hours to win this battle that they're fighting. And Velikowski, uh, his reasoning was, well, if the Israeli Hebrew army got the extra three or four hours they needed, to win this battle. Therefore, the sun must not have come up in China when it was supposed to the following day. And guess what? It didn't. Now, that would be pretty important. If, you know, if you're a scientist or an, the emperor mm-hmm. in China, the sun doesn't come up for three or four hours when it's supposed to, you think you might tell the scribes to make a notation of that? Of course you would. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's major news. But, that's, but that's, that's an example of Ancient Chinese historical documents verifying the book of Isaiah. And we know that the Chinese kept really, really detailed records. They, they were obsessed with record keeping. 